Um, my name is Tim Cotter. I'm the executive editor of the day. We're here with gubernatorial candidate for governor, uh, Bob Stefanowski. Uh, with me is Sten Spinella, our government reporter, Erica Moser, uh, business reporter, and, and Tim Dwyer, our publisher. Um, thanks for uh, coming here today, Bob, and sure, no problem. spending a little time with us. Uh, jumping right into the questions and starting with some something local. You came to New London, held a press conference um, on the state pier, yeah. and you've been a critic of the deal, particularly that cost overruns uh, picked up by the state. Um, but if elected governor, is there anything you can do? I mean, is there anything going back uh, backwards? I mean, that is a deal. What would you, what would you do if anything, if elected? Well, I think first of all, the part of the issue is a lack of disclosure or transparency. I think, particularly with respect to that peer, I would open up the files and and find out what's going on, both with that and the the FBI investigation. Um, Part of the reason I would argue I'm, I'm, I'm better qualified to be governor is I've, I've dealt with multi-billion and million dollar contracts. And, and to me, when you set up a three-way partnership with Orsted and Eversource and the state of Connecticut, and it's supposed to cost 70 to $90 million and it costs 300, if you decide to go forward, you split the overrun three ways. It, it's only fair that we do that. And I think this is taxpayer money, um, so we should be doing it. At a minimum, uh, we sit down and, and we say, listen, men and women, we have a problem here. We, rightly or wrongly, we massively understated the price. So to answer your question, I'd sit down with Eversource and Orsted once I understand the details, because I'll now have access to the details. And my principle is we went into this as three-way partners. You need to pick up the cost overrun. There's other partners you could do this deal with, and, and that's part of negotiating, right? If they think they have us trapped and and we're not going to advocate for taxpayers who are ultimately paying this bill then of course they're going to stick where they are but I, and you know I spoke at the CBIA the other week and I mentioned it never source was in the front row and they came up after said you really don't understand the deal I said okay well let's sit down and understand the deal but I can tell you it doesn't seem fair to me that the taxpayers of Connecticut imagine what we could do with that 300 230 million dollar overrun invested in education um, you know affordable housing so one of the, the themes I think I'll, I'll give you today is I work for you, right? I, I'm, the next 30 days is a job interview for me to be your governor, and I owe my responsibility to you. And that means people that vote for me and people that don't vote for me. And part of that is taking care of your money. I'm a fiduciary of your money. I don't think the governor has done a very good job of being a fiduciary of your money on the state pier, and I will be. Is it a true three-way equal partnership if – only one of the parties owns the, the pier? That's what Eversource brought up. They said, well, we're just renting it. But yeah. listen, if, if I rent a, a property to you and I think it's going to cost $50 million and it costs $200 million, I'm going to increase the rent. So whether it's ownership or renting, we jointly got into this thing. Just because they're renting and they don't own, to me, it's a little bit relevant, but I'm going to increase the rent. So you're not cost. looking for equal responsibility, just some responsibility. I, it may be equal, it may not be equal, yeah. but I can tell you where we are right now is dead wrong with taxpayers picking up 100% of it. Um, I had a few questions about your, I, I don't know, oh, does it. anyone else have anything else on state PR? I just wanted to. I, I, I would just yeah. follow up and say um, you're not against wind or, or, or no. a wind power, it's, it's just. No, I, I, listen, I think we got to look more at renewables. Um, instead of taxing fossil fuels, I think we've got to move, and there's a lot of technology out there that other countries are using that we can use to advance that. So wind, solar, green hydrogen, there's a lot of areas that, that we can go, and I think we should be pushing that to bring jobs to Connecticut. And, and global warming is a problem. You know, I know a lot of Republicans say it's made up. It's not made up. There's something going on. I don't know exactly what it is, but we need to address it but we need to do it in a balanced manner and not by giving $230 million away. Um, I had a few questions about your tax plan. You had sure. said that uh, if you cut the state budget by 4%, you could save $1 billion and finance the annual cost of the plan and said, I've got to believe I can find 4% of savings in this bloated budget. Where, where specifically do you see the blow? You know, what are some mm. of the things in the budget specifically mm. that you would, would cut? Well, the biggest tax we have right now is the corruption tax, which is 
the 230 million. I say a billion a year. That's 230 million right there. Uh, you look at what happened in West Haven. Not a massive number, but where they took a million dollars of COVID money and used it for marching bands and poker chips. Um, if it happened in in West Haven, I gotta believe it happened in 168 other towns. It'd be statistically uh, impossible that it hasn't happened somewhere else. If you look at the school construction uh, with Diamantis, that that could be hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's a big one. Um, and I, you know, Governor Lamont always jumps to you're going to rip out education or support. I'm not going to do that. Um, I would imagine we can do things more efficiently. I would imagine that there's some agencies that are as efficient as they possibly could be. Until I get in there, it's hard. I'm not dodging your question, but until I get in there and, and have a comptroller and an IG look at this, it's hard. But what I can tell you from experience is, is when I was the CFO of UBS, which is supposedly a very efficient bank, we didn't have any problem finding 5%. Um, I'd like to get rid of some of the perks. I, I don't think that, that I should be any different. I know it sounds small, but I hate the fact that the governor's logo is embossed on the back of a chair that he's going to take with him when he leaves. That's a $2,500 chair. I'm going to put a piece of masking tape over it, right, Bob? And, and that'll be it. I, I don't, you know, if I want to buy a leather chair, I'll buy it myself. So there's this, there's this sense up there that it's their money. And I throw out 5%. I don't know whether it's 3%, 8%. But I've never, even my budget, I could cut 5% from my personal budget. Most, not a, well, maybe not today, but some people could do it. So I can't tell you specifically where my gut tells you me it's there. If we eliminate the corruption, that's a big one to start with. Um, and then the other, you know, Along with that, with your tax plan, you said if elected, you would cut 200 taxes yes. on day one. You've you've cited a number of times the hypnotist registration fee, along with yeah. interior design license fee, tax on prepared foods, uh, and the diesel tax. Uh, I'm not expecting you to sit here and name 200 taxes, but what are some of the others that you've come across, you know, among those 200 that you would, would cut on day one? A lot of them don't make sense. There's a tax on vending machines. When you buy your uh, cheese crackers from the vending machine, there's a tax there. Um, there's a lot of taxes on business that I think that we should be waiving when, th when they go through um, a safety check. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do safety checks and we shouldn't do all of these things, but, but why are we burdening a business with taxes when they set up here? Um, they're bringing jobs. We should be welcoming these businesses. Business tax is fine. Business income taxes, they should pay that. But these administrative fees that chip away at you, um, you, probably, you, you may not like this answer, but you know, when you get a license, the, the, the park fee, the this fee, the that fee, I just don't think it's, it's fair and it, and it really adds up. I mean, I'm not saying I don't support parks either, but, but I just think we've gotten into this, this mode in Connecticut where if it, the, the phrase that you, know, you use on the stump, if it moves, we tax it. Th there is a certain element of truth to that. Um, and the bigger part of it is just to simplify and, and make things easier. The, the, the reason I'm okay cutting all those taxes is it's 0.25% of the revenue of the state of Connecticut. And I would imagine between all of the administrative effort, if you priced it all out, I'll bet it costs more for, to, to collect that tax, those taxes, than, when, than uh, what comes in. Um, I wanted to ask you about the rainy day fund since we're talking yeah. about the economy. Um, I know the governor has criticized you and Hodling for wanting to spend it down. At first, I want to ask if that's a fair criticism, and then I'm wondering um, how much of that rainy day fund would you spend on other things than, you know, paying down the pension debt? Hmm. Well, first of all, I think you have to understand where that, in my opinion, where that surplus came from, which is a $6 billion dollar. COVID grant from the federal government, which is, those are our tax dollars as well. Those are our federal, it's either federal tax dollars or debt that they put on in Washington that our kids are going to pay back. I'm not sure which one is worse. Um, so my view is that's our money as well. And I grew up in New Haven, um, and this isn't a sob story about my growing up because it was terrific, but um, we went there a couple weeks ago. We went to Visel's Drugstore, which is on the corner of Pond Street and uh, Dixville Avenue, where I grew up. And we had some people come up to us um, that I think that, you know, maybe the press thought we planted them somehow because they were saying exactly what I've been saying for months, which is they're making choices between prescription drugs and feeding their family. A lot of people are filling their gas tanks half full right now because if they fill it all the way, 
they can't afford to buy groceries. I think it's unconscionable. I don't know how I would do it. Get up every morning, be out in the field, talk to people like that, and then realize I've got $6 billion sitting in a bank account. So our program, which you could pick away at it, Connecticut first, we're saying we're going to give the average family back about $2,000, and it costs about $2 billion to do it. I think I'm better positioned than the governor to get us through the next recession. I could certainly get through a recession with $4 billion of reserves. Uh, so I think we should be giving some of that back. It's your money. It's not mine. People need it right now. We should give some of it back. You use the analogy of a rainy day. It's pouring outside. Electricity bills, gas prices, uh, rent payments, property taxes. It just adds up to where, where people are struggling. We, we, we did a three-day bus tour last week, and uh, we were in a diner on a Saturday morning, and I met with this man and woman. that They were a little bit older than me. I'm 60. They said, well, we got to leave now. We're going to work. I said, well, why are you going to work on a Saturday? And I, and I promise you this is a true story. They said, because we can't afford it. So we've got one of them had three jobs, one of them had two jobs. And they said, you know, we're not asking for a lot. We don't want to live in a mansion. This, I believe, was in Waterbury. We don't want to live in a mansion. Um, but we'd like to have the weekend off, <laughs> you know, go see our grandkids. And right now we can't. Other things, I'm, I'm going on too long, I'm sorry. The other thing I think we should invest in possibly more is education. Uh, we can talk about education yesterday, but I don't think this formula works either. It's one of the areas I do believe we should change. Um, but go ahead, I'll let you ask another yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, just to follow up, um, yeah. you know, you said the $2 billion in $2,000 per household. I'm assuming that's through taxes and tax credits. You wouldn't be sending it, checks. It, yeah, well, no, it's all of the above. It's, it's reducing the um, sales tax rate. It's got 40-year high inflation. I don't know why in the world we added a tax to food. It's prepared foods, in fairness. It's not all foods. But why in the world would you add a tax to fuel when inflation is 40 years highs? I think we should extend the uh, current gas tax holiday at least through 2023. See where we end up. Um, I think we should reverse the diesel tax increase that uh, Governor Lamont put through in July. On the business side, there's a lot we can do there. There's an unemployment insurance loan right now that we took out in the middle of COVID. That's exactly, exactly what the COVID assistance was supposed to do. Most states have paid off that unemployment loan. We're assessing it to businesses through their unemployment insurance every month. So that's adding to inflation. Uh, if I don't win, there's gonna be, which I will win, but if I didn't win, there's gonna be a truck, a, a highway use tax coming in. Another 70 million on small business. These businesses, they can't take much more. And I think there's a big disconnect. And, and, and Massachusetts just voted to do it as well because they have a large surplus. Give some of it back. I'm not saying all of it. I'm not saying go crazy and create the, a, 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 you know, a problem, but we've got it. People need it. We should give it back. And just one last point, and we all know why Governor Lamont's not doing it, because in order to do it, why in the world would he not give some of it back in an election year and help people? We know why, because he has to call a special session to do it, and he's afraid of keeping his caucus on board, and he's afraid of people coming up with bills. That's rule number one in a re-election year, an incumbent shouldn't call a special session. That upsets me, right? He's putting politics in front of people, and he should have the nerve to have a special session and get rid of that diesel tax, which he could have done on July 1st. Great, and last question on this subject. You, um I asked you for a number, you said $2 billion. Yeah. and then you also said something about education, so how Education's much Education is a whole other topic. I need to dig into it more. First of all, I think we need to use it more efficiently. You look at Hartford, I believe they're spending uh, 16000 per student per year in the high school. And about 30% of them don't graduate, and about 20% of them test at the age-appropriate level in math. And I grew up going to the New Haven and North Haven public schools and they were terrific. So we need to hold people accountable, but kids are behind. Kids are behind both socially and education-wise. You probably saw the report out of New Haven, only 20% of the kids. We should be allocating some of that funding to help kids catch up. This may be unpopular here, but I believe the funding should follow the child. That doesn't mean we should be abandoning the inner city schools. We need to, I went to one, we need to support them more. But I think people shouldn't be trapped in, in, in poor schools because of the zip code. We need to fund the charter schools. We need to fund the magnet schools. We need to fund 
trade schools. My daughter went to UC Berkeley. I, I wasn't real popular at UC Berkeley, but she's a social welfare major. She wants to help kids. And, you know, she's making okay money, but, but you know, that's fine for some kids. And I admire the heck out of her for doing that. But these kids coming out of trade schools have three, four, five job offers. And small businesses dying for people with basic engineering skills. One of the things my wife and I looked at, we, we thought long and hard about whether to run for not. We were actually looking at a building on the corner here in New London to buy it and convert it to some kind of training school or boys and girls club or something to give people skill sets. We should talk about New London. What an opportunity it is to develop the city. I, I, I don't know why it hasn't connected, but I know we have it only, what do we have, an hour? I'd like to have three hours. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what, what, what more do you want to see? I mean, what would you do for New London specifically? Well, I think governor? property, t with a mill rate that high, it makes it hard. But you think about it. If you were to tell somebody, you're next to the water, you're next to an electric boat, you're somewhere between uh, Boston and, and New York, you got a train service coming through. We've been saying all this for years, yeah. I mean, I think it starts with, with, with making it more affordable. Um, I think it starts with perhaps some more affordable housing because I would imagine you're getting a lot of requests from electric growth. They're upscaling right now. It's a beautiful downtown center. These buildings are amazing. And, I, you know, the, 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 the theater over there, I mean, I, I don't, un I, after we win, I'd love to talk to you guys about what hasn't worked. And I'd like to provide some either funding or advice or whatever I can do to get it going. But this, this town could be beautiful. It's so beautiful already, but I mean, we could really remake it, and I, I don't know why. I mean, I, uh, maybe after we're done, I can get your thoughts as to why. I know this is my time, but I'd love to hear from you guys what we can do. But when you have a mill rate that high, it's hard. Um, yeah, you mentioned affordable housing. Um, it, you know, we talk, you guys talked about 830G yeah. in that debate. Um, yeah. You know, that law is supposed to bolster the state's affordable right. housing. Um, so if you want to get rid of it, like you said, how would you make housing more affordable? How I'm would gonna, you add affordable housing? I'm going to give you a little bit of a long answer on this one. Okay. And, and if you guys want to go over, I'm happy to do it. I'm a product of affordable housing. You know, I, I still remember the day we are in a three-family house off of Dixel Avenue. It was me, my parents, my grandparents, and crazy Southern students on the top level. I can still remember being woken up in the middle of the night by the, the, the parties. My dad came to me when I was in second grade, said, we're moving to North Haven. I said, why? So he went to Hill House. My mom, they never went to college. He went to Hill House. He, he ran the, the, the scoreboard at the Oval. He said, because I picked the town that we can afford that has the best schools. $25,000 house in North Haven. I've got three older sisters. I won't give you the whole sob story, but I, basically my room was a closet uh, with a window that was converted. And it was fine till I went over six feet. Then I had to curl my feet up a little bit. But it was, it, it was a terrific, a safe community. He took out a 30-year 30, 30 fixed-rate mortgage, paid it off to the penny every single month. Went to the public schools, three other sisters. One went to Yale, uh, one went to um, UConn, one went to Albertus Magnus, and I went to Fairfield. People say you're a rich white guy. You don't have a sense. I know what it's like. My dad never had a credit card. And the reason I'm running, and I hate to get you know, anxious about this, is to give people the opportunity that I had. I don't embear, I, I'm not, embar I'm proud of what I was able to do and what my, my sisters were able to do and what my daughters can now do. One of them went to Berkeley, one's out at UC Santa Barbara, and one uh, is, uh, is in New York right now. She went to Cornell. More people should have the opportunity. So the problem, though, is 830G doesn't work. I think it's 130 of 169 towns don't comply with it right now. It was put in place before the fall of the Berlin Wall. I am not anti-affordable housing. I'm a product of it. But I don't think threatening towns by saying if you don't get to 10%, you're going to lose your, your, your transportation funding. In fact, the current formula, people senior housing, they get half a point. You don't get credit for housing before a certain date. I think it's 1991. I think we should re, uh, repeal and replace it. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of unused buildings on, this, on the books in the state of Connecticut. Why can't we redevelop some of those and create public housing? We have tons of area that's undeveloped. Why can't I team with the different towns and start to develop that? Uh, towns are different. One size doesn't fit all. I mean, the answer in, in, in a town with three acres zoning is not the answer in, in North Haven, where I grew up with quarter acre zoning. I'm going to hold people accountable for providing it. 
and we'll talk about when, once I'm in what maybe we can do if people don't comply. But I think this stick approach right now isn't working. People are ignoring it. Some towns are very, very good at it. Sometimes I admire Fairfield. They don't, they don't comply yet, but at least they're working towards it. And this is not about, you know, you have a very different discussion in New Canaan than you do in Bridgeport. I, I honestly get both sides of this. Because some people, it's their largest asset, and they don't want a 15-story skyscraper, uh, you know, a foot next to their, to their largest single investment. And I get that. But there's got to be a balanced approach collaboratively to fix this problem. And I also think we need to upgrade the cities, the, school, the, 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 the housing in the cities, because you shouldn't force somebody to leave like my family. You shouldn't be forced to leave New Haven. We didn't want to leave New Haven. If there were better schools and better options, we, we would have stayed. And so people should have the flexibility to leave if they want to, but not be forced to go to some other town because they're too afraid to live where they are. So I know I'm rambling, but I really feel strongly about this stuff. No, and, and it drives me nuts when I see the attack ads and Bob's this, Bob's that. I'm convinced if I had 10 minutes with everybody in this state and Governor Lamont had 10 minutes, I'd win by 10 points. But you can't get it across. In, in, in a 30 second commercial. Anyway, this is therapeutic for me. No, oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't care if you guys are enjoying you, you, it. You, talk, you talked about your background, yeah. um, which probably a lot of people aren't aware of. Yeah. Because of campaign ads, though, they're aware of, of the payday loan company. Yeah. Now, you think that you're getting a bad rap. Um, in, in what way do you think that's the case? So, again, I, I, I'm proud of what we did there. Um, there's about 20% of the world's population that has no access to banks. So you know where they're going? They're going to very bad places. So when I sat down to interview for that job, I said, listen, I'll take this job on, on, on one condition. We're going to improve the collection practices. We're not going to be a, a, as bad as we are. We're going to create a lower rate product. We're going to graduate people from loan sharks, which is basically the alternative, to payday lenders, to middle rate loans, to this. And our job is to graduate our customers to normal banks so that they have access to money and banking facilities. And we did a terrific job of that. And we actually got good reviews from the regulators for what we did. So you can either ignore a problem and say, oh yeah, let's just leave those 20%, it's not a problem, or you can address it. And I understand why they're hitting me on it, because the industry, rightfully so, has a bad reputation. But I went in, I changed out the, we had 30 direct reports to me, I changed out 29 of them. And we brought in people with competence, people with integrity, people that wanted to help. And we changed that thing, and I'm proud of what we did there. Now, he can attack me all he wants. And I could talk about his cable company, and I could attack back. But listen, I am proud of what we did there. We need more people doing that kind of thing. Um, abortion is, is, is a big uh, hmm. issue clearly across the country, one that Democrats are, are uh, campaigning on. Yeah. Now, you've come out as um, pro-choice, mm. but the governor kind of implies through advertising that maybe that's not really the case um, because you didn't mm. come out right away uh, and, and, and speak on that issue. What, what do you say to that? You know, I thought long and hard about this to, to call a sitting governor a liar, but, but he is. Um, I was pro-choice in 2018. Um, I've come out multiple times and said Roe v. Wade is codified in Connecticut state law. I think that's a good thing, and it's not going to change. This should be a 10-second discussion. Either you believe, If you don't believe me, I get it, but either you believe me or you don't, and I can't say it any differently than how I've said it. He's lying. And, and you know why? Because he doesn't want to talk about how crime is out of control. He doesn't want to talk about two FBI investigations. He doesn't want to talk about um, affordable housing. He doesn't want to talk about inflation. And this is a national strategy. In my case, I'm fortunate to live in a state where it's codified. And I don't think anybody thinks, hopefully, we get a Republican-led legislature. And by the way, the codification of Roe v. Wade, that was bipartisan. That was on a bipartisan vote. So this is a not, well, I shouldn't say it's a non-issue. It's not a political issue. I understand why people are concerned uh, when you look at what's happening at the national level and some states, but it's not going to change in Connecticut. We're going to protect a woman's right to choose, period. But, but that's not necessarily true. Why? Um, well, because uh, your, the Republican Party wants to make it a, a national law, the law. 
I wouldn't support that. But I even if you didn't, um, if the Republicans gain control of both houses of the of the uh, Congress, hmm. they could pass a law outlawing abortion. But that's why I'm not running for Senate or the House. It's more dysfunctional up there. No, I understand, and I take you. I, I, I can be an advocate for letting no. the states control it, and I can promise the people that I'm going to serve. I'm not going to change it. I can't. I can't do it right. more than that. No, I understand your position, and and I, you know, we take you at your word on it and believe yeah. you. But I think, in, for me, um, you look at you know the dichotomy of the Republican Party where they're against you know vaccine and mask mandates and they cite personal freedom, mm. and then they want to pass a law uh, taking away the personal freedom of mm. women to make choices about their own mm. body and abortion. And while I like your position, mm. I don't like your party's position. So mm. how do you do, well, let me deal push with that? back a little on that. Um, I don't know what your position is, but some Democrats feel abortion should be allowed right up to the point of birth. Um, arguably, the Democrats haven't done a great job with the economy. So I can start trying to pin Ned with stuff that he doesn't have anything to do with. Yeah. I think it's dangerous to stereotype any entire party because there's liberal and there's conservatives. I'm a fiscal conservative and a social moderate. And I happen to be in a party where there's extremely people right and probably some people in the middle. It's hard, but you got two to pick from. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. This might be the last abortion question, I think. But sure. one of the things the governor said last week when he met with us here is that um, you refuse or haven't commented on the safe harbor law that was passed in this past legislative session. Yeah. So I'm not asking if you want to change it, but just do you support it? Are you in favor of, are you glad they passed that this past session? Okay, if he wants to blame me for, for not supporting it, it's a law. Just like abortion has been codified, I'm going to support it. I'm not going to change it. I wasn't in the legislature. I didn't hear the debate back and forth. My lieutenant governor voted for it. I trust her judgment. I'm not going to repeal it. That's a silly. That's just silly. So do you support it or not? I'm still I support kind of it in that I'm going to enforce it. Yeah, okay. I didn't vote on it. I don't know how I would. I think I would have voted for it, but I wasn't part of the process. You, I guess I'm just asking if you think it was good legislation. I wasn't involved in passing it. I'll support it, and I'll continue to enforce it. But come on, he's picking at gnats right now. If that's the best argument he's got as to why, after I've said for six months and in 2018 I'm going to support a woman's right to choose, that's weak. If that's his best argument, have at it. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, in talking about that, you, you mentioned crime. Uh, you know, the, the 2021 crime in Connecticut report showed that while overall crime was down, the number of murders were, were still up after spiking in, in 2020, meaning that last year had, had more murders than any other year in the past decade. What, what do you think could be done, what do you think the state should do, or what should be done at the state level to address murders specifically? Yeah, first of all, crime isn't down. I mean, you, as you guys know, you can take a set of statistics and make any argument you but want. But I mean, when you look at all the other types of crime, I mean, there's others that are up as well. But well, that, yeah. You know, um, Sexual assault is sexual up. Sexual assault is up, but those, um, those were the two I'm talking about. Hartford's having its worst, so. uh, worst homicide year in decades. Um, I think we need to reverse parts of that police mm -hmm. accountability bill. I think that when you see things like happen in New Haven with the person in the back of the van who wasn't, it's a horrible video, we have to hold the bad actors accountable. Absolutely. And when you say police going over the line, those individual officers need to be held accountable. But I would argue it's the vast major minority of police that are involved in that. One percent, I don't know what the right number is. For the other 99 percent, we need to support the heck out of them. Um, I've been meeting with officers all summer, and, and many of the reason we're down 400 state troopers, and I fundamentally believe this, and 100 officers in, in New Haven, and 100 officers in Hartford, is a combination of lack of respect from this governor and qualified immunity. And that's the other reason crimes are done, because they're not chasing anybody anymore. <laughs> their personal assets are, risk, are at risk. Their kids' college education fund, their houses are at risk. Of course, crime's down. They're not chasing. So we need to support law enforcement. His own state troopers, as you guys know, gave him a 97% vote of no confidence. That's unheard of. I don't know that that's happened in the history of the world. So this is not a knock on police officers not doing their job. This is a knock on lack of respect and not giving them the tools. Part of that bill that I liked was body cams. Because the p police officers that are doing the right thing, they're happy to have it. 
And, and I think it protects people that you can see it. I'm glad there's a video of what happened in New Haven because we can hold the officers responsible. But crime is out of, he can throw whatever stats he wants, but people are nervous. Everything from catalytic converters to car thefts to, 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 you know, to, to the uh, violent crimes, it's a problem. And I'm committed to, to, you know, to fix it. And, the, and fixing it is not throwing out a bunch of statistics in an election year and saying, oh, look, it's down. He's putting, peop he's putting politics ahead of people's safety right now, and that's a dangerous place to go. And I hate to get animated about it, but he is absolutely, he's putting politics ahead of people's affordability, and he's putting politics ahead of people's safety. And I don't care if I get elected. Well, I'd love to be elected for a second term, but in my election year, I'm not going to do things. I'm going to put people first. I'm not going to do things for political reasons. And I'm sorry to get angry about it, but it is wrong what's happening right now. We're sitting on $6 billion that could help people fill their oil tanks. Crime's out of control. We're saying it's fine. This is not, this is not fair to the people of Connecticut. I asked you something similar to this in the scrum after the debate, but <laughs> how do you plan, because Democrats have said they have no interest in revising that law, so how would you get them on board with, with doing I that? I think when you, look at, when, when you look at the will of the people right now, at least what I hear, and you look at the amount of crime that's out there, and you look at the, how that has decimated police forces to dangerously low levels. And, and, and the state troopers came out the other day and said, this is a safety crisis. I would hope that the legislators do the right thing. I've got Laura Devlin, who's well-respected state rep out of Fairfield. She's been up there eight years. She's pragmatic. She's um, disciplined. She's got a good reputation. I, I hired her for that reason. I also wanted to hire somebody different than me. I want to surround myself with people that are different than me. I don't want to be surrounded by people that think and look like me. I, I want a diversity of opinion. And I would hope I could build a relationship with the legislature such that they would see that what the right thing is to do. And I know it's a lot harder than I can ever imagine. I get it. But at least I'm going to try. I was at a, a meeting in, at Hill House High the other week with, uh, with Robin Porter. And she said some things that I thought a lot about. And she made a very cogent argument, and I'm not, I haven't taken a position on it yet, but why there shouldn't be suspensions and, and expulsions in school. Because those kids are definitely on the wrong track if they're not coming to school anymore. And I hadn't even really thought of that. So I'm open to new ideas. I'm not saying whether I support that or not, but, but we should be considering different ideas instead of locking people out and not, sit, not answering FOI requests and this big shroud of secrecy. That's not right for the people. One you mentioned at the beginning that see yourself as a public servant so what would your definition of public service leadership be uh, number one keep people safe that's one of the things that's fundamentally a government priority and if you look at why government was set up that was a big reason number two listening to people one of the best I, I mentioned it in the debate well maybe I didn't I don't know but one of the best meetings I've had was two union teachers in Hartford I, I, I convinced them to go out to lunch with me um, and they started the lunch by saying I don't know why you're doing this we're never gonna vote for you I said, I, I get it, but I really want to hear what's going on on the front lines. And by the end of the lunch, they said, you know, we're still not voting for you, but, but we appreciate that you spent time with us and that you understand the issue because nobody does that. we got to get out and talk to small business owners. They, I thought their biggest thing was taxes. It's not. It's lack of qualified labor. That's their biggest issue. They can't find people to work. Um, I meet with teachers. They tell me a different thing. I meet with police officers. I know GE's had its problems, but one of the things Jack Welch preached was you spend 70% of your time with customers, 20% of your time with employees, and 10% in the office. And taxpayers are my customers, or my clients, or my employers, whatever you want to use. And I think sometimes in Hartford, we've gotten so out of touch with what's really happening on the ground. We used to do skip level meetings. If, if, if you only talk to your commissioners, what are they going to tell you? Everything's great. I'm doing a great job. We used to do skip level. We'd go over that manager to the next level. That's where you hear if you can get the people to open up. That's where you hear what's going on. So we need to get out and talk to people. If you were elected governor, you'd be one of 50 governors, obviously, in the United States was a pretty prominent position to have. So um, I know uh, you're not responsible for all the views of everyone in the Republican Party, but if you were elected, you'd have a prominent position in the party. And, you know, the Washington Post reported that a majority of the GOP nominees running for office, um, 299, denied the 2020 election results. Um, so 
Um, that worries me. Uh, as a, as a, you know, the leader of a newspaper, we're pro-democracy, obviously, and we're, mm. we're worried about our democracy because of that. So um, if you're elected and you have that prominent position, what would you do to protect our democracy against people who deny election results? Again, I, I know I'm biased, but I, I think I would be good to throw into the mix of the 50 governors. I mean, you see these attack ads, they make me look like I don't know what. Um, I'm a reasonable guy. You know, I'm not what, what Ned portrays on the attack ads. I've got three daughters. Hopefully you've seen my latest commercial, which is getting some good reaction. I'm a family guy. You may not agree with all of my points, but I, I'm a reasonable guy, and I'm going to work hard. Um, I've been saying for months, Joe Biden won. we got to move on. There's too much politics. If Donald Trump had anything to do, anything, with January 6th, and they're doing a very thorough investigation of that, he should be held accountable. Let's move on. I think what I can provide to the 50 governors is some level of, like, moderation. I'm a pragmatic guy. I don't always get the best. I'm, I'm not a genius, right? I, I, I've never this. I, in fact, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. I hire people that are smarter than me on purpose. But I'm a rational guy. I'm middle of the road. I've got common sense. I don't care about politics. I mean, I, didn't, I, I haven't been dreaming about a political career my whole life. I just turned 60. My wife and I sit down. We said, how are we going to help the state? Are we better off buying a Boys and Girls Club down here and being, which probably would have been more enjoyable, to be honest with you. But we, th we thought the scope, to your point, the scope and the amount of impact we can have on the state of Connecticut is much larger as governor. I guess, I guess what I'm asking. When I go to, con I'll be the voice of reason. Hopefully, if I'm at an RGA meeting and people are debating whether, whether, whether Joe Biden, I would say, what are you guys talking about? We got poverty out there. We got national crisis. Let's talk about what matters. But go ahead, I cut you off. No, that's okay. Um, uh, I guess what I'm alluding to is, uh, you know, I'm looking for Republicans who fight for democracy and are willing to speak out against what's going on, um, even within their party, to protect democracy. Um, because a lot of people don't, a lot of Republicans, especially in Washington, and I know you're not going to be in Washington, but. Um, they don't speak out when they say, have see people saying repeatedly, white is black and black is white. They don't say anything about it. Or um, when uh, someone uses or tries gets the the spectators use the N word at a rally, and no one speaks out about it, and uh, it's slowly, I think, eroding the normalcy of our democracy, mm -hmm. and we're accepting more and more. So, in my mind, uh, I'm. I'm more than willing to support Republicans, but I want Republicans who are going to fight to save democracy and take a leadership role in speaking out against um, the behavior um, we, that we know was not right. It's a fair point, and and again, there's a and and I will, um, but again, there's a reason I'm not running for for senator, and and I know I'm I'm now a public voice, and I need to be the voice of moderation. I need to speak out. Um, and I've got certain values that I'm not going to break. I, I put out a tweet celebrating Pride Month. And the far right jumped on me, right? And I got on, I think it was Lee Elsie's show, which is a conservative. I said, listen, I'm not going to change that position. What are you guys talking about, right? I support, I support that. And I support, you know, different styles and different views. And that's what America is all about. So I stand for my principles. But I also think at a state level, when, when a state rep running for state rep says police officers only run for office because they want to get girls because the uniform looks good, I think the governor should be speaking out against that just as well. So I do think it's both-sided. My, my thing, i got to look my, girls, my three girls in the eye every morning. And so if somebody at the party national level is saying something that I fundamentally agree with, is it my number one priority to speak out against it? I'll be honest with you, it's not because it doesn't impact Connecticut. But in forums where I'm being asked about those things, I'm certainly going to tell my mind. You know, it's not real popular with, with the far right for me to say that President Biden won the election and that President Trump should be held accountable. But that's what I believe. So hopefully that would be somewhat of an indication in an election year that I'm going to speak my mind. Who are, who are your uh, political role models, either past or present? <laughs> That's a good question. I, you know, I always liked Reagan. You guys may not like him, I, 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 but he was always positive. 
and, and optimistic about the future. And I thought he was fair to people. Baker, I think, is a good model. Charlie Baker, um, fiscal conservative, social moderate. And again, when, when I win, I work for everybody. You know, I think my humble opinion, Joe Biden, we should have, I'd love to have a beer with you sometime and talk about it. Joe Biden getting up and demonizing half of the people that, in my view, he works for. Certainly, you need to speak your mind. But there's going to be a lot of people that don't vote for me, and I've got to serve them as well as the ones that do. And again, I want a variety of opinions. And to the extent it's my authority to make the decision, I'll make it. But it, but it should be collaborative. It should be a discussion, and, and, and we should have different views. You know, politics has become very polarizing, to your point. I don't think that's good. So I'd, I could tell you one thing I'm not going to do is stand up and pound my fist and say, you know, Joe Biden's not pre He's president. <laughs> Let's move on. Somewhat related to this question about the 2020 election, um, what's your position on no excuse absentee voting, early voting, and do you support restrictive measures such as like voter ID laws? Well, I think, first of all, we should make it as accessible as we can, right? I do think we have to fix the voter rolls, though. When, when they sent out um, during COVID absentee uh, applications, there was like, I forget the number, but thousands, if not tens of thousands, were returned. And, and how many stories have you heard about, well, this is for my son who now votes in Oregon. I, one of the things we've got to do is clean up the voter rolls. Once we do that, we should provide as much access as we can. Um, I do think we should have signature verification. I don't think that's a, a horrible thing to ask for. Um, but I am not against early voting. I'm not against making it more flexible as long as it's, it's, it's accurate and, and we can control it. So you'd be in favor of no excuse absentee voting as long as there is signature verification? And we get the voter rolls cleaned okay. up. Thank you. And we can prove it. Um, one thing as you're running, it, it's very striking at a, you know, at, I, I was at the CBI event uh, and and just in any event with both you and Governor Lamont, you know, it, it makes sense for him as the incumbent that he's focusing on, you know, things that he thinks Connecticut is doing well. He's picking out, you know, the positive statistics or rankings and you're focusing on, you know, more of the negatives um, and, and, you know, the, the, the poor rankings that Connecticut has on a lot of, um, you know, economic and fiscal lists. But, um, it, you know, if you're elected, do you think that would be an issue? Or how do you sort of pivot then to, you know, working to attract to uh, attract businesses and people mm. to Connecticut? Because as governor, I guess you, mm. you'd have to portray kind of a mm. positive image of, of right. here's why you should want to come to Connecticut. So why should people want to come to Connecticut? Right. And how do you kind of pivot from your, your messaging now? So it, it, here's what I would argue. I think, um, again, in my humble view, I think Governor Lamont is presenting things as better than they are because it's an election year. I would push back a little bit, which I, I have said what I think is wrong. And, and listen, I get it. It's easy for a non-incumbent to do that. But I've also laid out specific plans as to how I think I could fix it. And that's one thing I learned between last time and this time. It's not just pointing out the problems. It's pointing out how you're going to fix it. And regardless of who you give the credit to, we're in a decent situation where we got $6 billion. Now, we also have $100 billion of long-term debt, which we can talk about. Um, but we've got some tools right now where we can fix it. The other place I would challenge you is I don't think Governor Lamont has done more than tell people how great it is. It, there's no plans out there as to how he's going to make it better. I haven't heard one proposal, well, maybe a couple, about what we should do going forward. And we're about to enter a recession. We're already in it by pure definition, which you can argue what the definition is, but we've had two quarters of, of economic decline. Some would call that a recession. The next person in office is going to need some plans to help us get through that. And I haven't heard his plans. I've laid mine out. You can pick at it. You can say, where are you going to find the cause? I, I get that. But, but I've been honest. And, and until you realize you have a problem, it's going to be hard to fix it. And I think Governor runs the risk of telling everybody everything's fine when I can tell you, we just got what done with a three-day bus tour with random people. It's not fine out there. It is not. I was hoping to ask you a gun question sure. really quick. Um, are there any gun control measures that you would support in office? Do you think there's anything more that needs to be done in Connecticut to regulate gun ownership? I would certainly look at it, but I, but I do think our gun laws right now, I think it's not that they're not tough enough. They're the toughest in the nation. I think we have to start enforcing them. And when you're down hundreds of officers, it's hard to enforce them. 
Um, there was a mental aspect of, of 1161 that I don't think was ever fully funded. I would relook at that and allocate some funding to it. Um, certainly most of the mass shootings that you see, these horrible tragedies, there were, there were signs. COVID's made it worse where people have been, kids have been up in their bedrooms playing these video games. I think we should look at video games as well because some of these are killing simulators. Um, but I don't think we have enough focus on it right now. It's politically expedient to go after law-abiding gun owners. That's what the governor tends to do. We should, we should, we should make sure that we, don't, that we support law-abiding gun owners, but we gotta limit what happens outside of that, and there's a lot happening outside of that. So I would certainly be open to anything that we can do to prevent that from happening. Um, and I'm not going to reverse any parts of a law. Governor Lamont lies about that, too. I'm going to keep the gun laws where they are. I'm going to enforce them, and we're going to keep people safe. My son's a junior in high school, so um, I talked to a lot of teachers uh, in the high, local high school, and um, teachers are having kind of a rough time, even with post-COVID, having a hard time finding teachers, having a hard time keeping teachers. Even the teachers that are teaching are having a difficult time with outside noises coming into their classroom. So even history teachers are afraid to teach current events because of the kids going home and telling their parents what they're saying and then getting barraged with emails from parents that they shouldn't be talking about that stuff. So what would you do to support the teachers, um, right. and encourage people to go into teaching and then, um, and then protect them from being able to teach what they're supposed to teach without parental harassment and interference. Yeah, I'll go back to the meeting I had with the, the Hartford teachers. It was really good because I got a better appreciation. I mean, we're asking teachers to be security guards. In some cases, we're asking them to be parents. Um, we're asking them to, you know, teach. We're asking a lot of teachers, and, and I, we may have to pay them more. I mean, when you start Hartford with 90 substitute teachers, and you've known that deadline's coming for a year, it's not like we're surprised when school starts. Um, maybe we need to pay entry-level teachers more. Maybe we need to pay uh, starting level. Here, here's my view. On, we have to teach the history, right, of, of America. And some of it's good and some of it's bad. The pace I push back is, is telling whether a kid is privileged or unprivileged is that they kind of have this original guilt. That have they you seen that happening in, in Connecticut? Or like, what are some examples of that? Absolutely. Look at, look at the teacher um, in Greenwich who comes out and says he actively recruits Democrats because he wants to, and he doesn't take any teacher over 30 years old, and he won't recruit Roman Catholics. And I don't know how prevalent it is. You see Pizzagate up in Enfield. Where, where, so I, I agree, teachers shouldn't be worried about what they teach, but we should be teaching kids how to think, not what to think. And I know that's a fine line, I get it, and I know being a teacher is not easy. But I'll tell you, there's probably a lot of stuff going on out there. That, yeah, that we don't even know about. Like how, how widespread is that, you know, with, with Greenwich and Enfield? Like, are those isolated examples? Because it seems like the type of thing where you hear about every example there is because people are upset about it. So is this isolated instance or a larger issue, do you think? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would imagine if it's happened in three towns, it's happening elsewhere. I, don't, I doubt that it's every town. Um, I do think having local control of these school boards is a good thing. I do think some of these school boards have gone across the line demonizing some parents. You know, you, you, you saw the cartoon back in April, which it was a bunch of Halloween characters, mm -hmm. and they said, those are your Republicans going to, to teacher boards. Well, what are we doing demonizing, you know, parents that care about their kids? Um, you asked me kind of hypothetically where I am. That's where I'm coming out on it. I know there's instances of it. I don't know how prevalent it is. It's hard for a governor to know that, in fairness to Governor Lamont. But I do think we got to hire the right people for these school boards. I think a lot of people were, some of them favorably impressed, some of them not, when kids were home for COVID and they were looking over the, over the screen at what their kid was being taught. There's probably some positive and, and, and some negative. But, but I realize the cultural issues are, are, are important, but I also think we got to get back to teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic and trades. I, I went to Fairfield University. I wanted to be an accountant. But it's important to me to go to a liberal arts school so that they have both. They've got the perspective, and then we're also teaching them the pragmatic skills. One of the, at Fairfield's a Jesuit school. One of the best courses I ever had, it was a, a priest who, who, who taught that God couldn't exist. Right? I didn't agree with him, but his whole former, he obviously got kicked out, and his whole course was God cannot exist, here's why. 
Now, I do believe God exists, but, but to have that perspective, I think, is important. And I'm sorry if I'm rambling today, but I really want you guys to get a sense of what I am, not the 30-second attack ad that you see with, I don't know where they find these grainy pictures of me. I mean, I didn't, but it makes me, <laughs> it makes me look lousy. And listen, whether you guys endorse me or not, I, you, you're very fair. I, I've had very good interactions with your people. Um, I would just ask you to take a risk. I mean, you guys have endorsed Republicans before. And I, it's kind of stumpish, but I say, if you think there's more disclosure about what's going on in government than there was four years ago, and you think it's safer than it was four years ago, and you think our infrastructure is better than it was four years ago, and you think it's cheaper than it was four years ago, vote for Lamont. I can't, you know, I, and I respect you if you have that opinion. But if you don't, give a reasonable guy who's just trying to help the state, who's got a different perspective and a different approach, give me a try. about our ownership, Bob, but uh, we're a locally owned. Your trust, right? Right, we're yeah. owned by a split trust. We donate our profits to the community since we adopted that ownership model. We've uh, given away more than $12 million to the community. So, um, you know, we, we don't make a large profit. We're a small company because we donate or reinvest it in the company. And most of the editorials we write are about local issues. But the three issues, especially in the last couple of years that we look at nationally are, are protecting democracy, um, gun control laws, um, and voting rights. Um, especially, you know, um, I mean, Connecticut has good gun laws, but um, again, um, you know, I, I, I like to someday live in a country where people can go to a, a grocery store, a church, uh, a concert, a movie, a school, and not worry about being shot by a mass shooter. Um, so that's really important, especially what's happening in Connecticut. I agree with you on that, and, and I understand on guns, but I also think there's other, for example, school security. I mean, you look at, again, we're sitting with $6 billion. Um, you go into a bank for our money, layers of security, cameras, bulletproof glass. You go to a museum. You can't get close to any of the paintings. Now, we got our kids in 30-year-old in buildings with locks that may or may not work. We, one of the things we've thrown out is we should do an inspection of every school, and we should make sure there's only one entry and egress point. We should have cameras for people coming in and out of school. Why? I'm sure there's schools that are not up to snuff right now. Why aren't we looking at that um, and allocating some of this $6 billion to the people that need to fix the schools? So I think I get you on guns, I totally get you, but I also think sometimes that's the expedient way for, for, for politicians to attack you on. There's mental health, there's school security, there's the, f the family, you know, breakup. And I think it, it needs a, I hate the word holistic because it sounds political, but we really need a holistic approach. You look at what happened in Texas, it, you know, they got in through a door that wasn't locked. How can that happen? And God help us if something like that happens in Connecticut and we haven't made the schools as, as secure as we could. You also look at happened with Texas, and the law enforcement was there, and for how many, an hour, armed why to the teeth, well, and didn't do anything. Why don't every so, teacher have a panic button around their neck yeah. so they can press it when, when there's something going on? Well, and, I, mean, and I think, every, I think that, that whole school was pressing the panic button. They were calling 911. Well, that's a fair point, too, and, and those people <laughs> need to be held accountable. I just... Sometimes this place seems upside down, and, and I know I can't fix everything, but I fundamentally believe if we're going to rebuild America, we need to do it from the bottom up, and that's why I'm not running for Senate. I, I don't want to get into that hornet's nest up there. I think if we get the communities proper and the state proper and other people do it, and to your voice, I can be a voice of reason nationally, I'm going to do it. we got tons of great, I mean, to your point, we got tons of great things in Connecticut, universities, location, people, innovation. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do with this state. I just think we need a different approach. I'll give you one last example. I know the cities, right? I, find, I grew up in New Haven. I, I, I want to make the cities better, but my view is we need to create a sense of independency. In my humble view, we've created a sense of dependency. And when I was in New Haven on, Vic, on Dixwell Avenue outside of Weisel's Drugstore, the first thing that guy said to me is, I want a job. And we haven't done a very, we got a thousand unfilled jobs and we got people on unemployment. Invest in trade schools, invest in, and I know it's a lot harder than I can ever imagine, but invest in after-school programs. Have adult education at some of these schools. As 
CBI has pointed out one of the issues is that even if we did f- fill every opening in the state, there would, even if every person in the state who was unemployed got a job, there would still be job openings. Um, and, and, you know, I know they, they were talking about the labor shortage a lot. It's, it's something I've written about and talked to people about a lot. Um, kind of two things here. I mean, one, you know, what are some of the ways you think, because if there's not enough people in the state to fill those jobs, you know, how do we do a better job of bringing people in from out of state? And then do you also envision, you know, for some specific, programs like I look at the the eastern um, the the manufacturing pipeline initiative and that's had you know more than 2,500 placements uh, mostly at EB but other manufacturers since 20 2016 you know free training program like would you envision expanding something like that for other fields nursing IT whatnot and then are there other you know ideas you have for bringing people out of state to fill jobs (coughs) it's not life-changing but right now we tax companies on their cost to train people why would we do that? Let's get rid of that. Part of it, I think, is having an environment that attracts young people. Um, my daughter's 28, 24, and 20. When they go out, they drive right by Hartford and they go to Boston. And they drive right by Bridgeport and they go to New York. So revitalization of cities. When I grew up in New Haven, we had the Yale Bowl. Pele was there. The Giants were there. There were concerts there. We had the New Haven Nighthawks go through Hartford. Hart, my, I met my wife in the gold building in Hartford. We go out to Brown Thompson's. Now it's a taco. No, nothing wrong with tacos, but, you know, the whalers, places to go. So you got to create a situation where young people want to live here. Um, give some breaks to, to young people for property taxes and other things so they can buy a house. It's not like when we grew up. I don't think the goal is to buy a house anymore and settle, which is fine, but give people that opportunity to do it. Invest in the trade schools. Um, make business more competitive. Every business I visit with, almost everyone has three letters on their desk, one from Florida, one from North Carolina, and you know, one from somewhere else down there offering no property, no uh, sales taxes. They're offering uh, free property you know, and more affordable housing. So we have to make Connecticut more affordable and get businesses and people to come here. And, and we got a great reputation. Look at what, what Massachusetts did in, in you know, creating an innovation center. They showed you that it can be done. I mean, and we got as, just as good a university as Harvard does. And um, we need to look at how we do that faster. I, I think sometimes we're looking too much, to your point earlier, too much in the rear view mirror and not about, well, I, I think we're kind of in this, this cloister sometimes. That's not the right word, but in this bubble. There's a lot happening out in this world that we could be, we could be doing. And I can't wait to get through this campaign and be able to actually act on it. My strong point is not campaigning. My strong point will be governing. Although I've gotten better at it, but I'm still not, still not Bill Clinton. 